Welcome back to another Q&A video where I answer your questions. You guys asked over 200 questions and I'm going to do my best to answer the best ones. We've got great questions like Nvidia RTX 50 laptop GPUs, will I be testing the Framework 16 laptop, repasting laptops, laptop GPU comparisons, basically everything about gaming laptops, so let's get into it. But first, Gigabyte have sponsored this part of the video. Gigabyte's high-end Aorus gaming laptops have been redesigned this year, while budget conscious gamers are covered by the updated G5. These laptops are more powerful than ever with Nvidia's latest GeForce RTX 40 series graphics, allowing you to enhance your gaming experience and get smoother gameplay with DLSS3 frame generation in the latest titles. And Gigabyte have got content creators covered with their newly updated Aero 16 and brand new Aero 14 for ultimate portability. Check out the sponsored link below to find out more. Alright, so the first question is what do you think about RTX 50 series GPU? Is it worth waiting for or just buy the laptop with RTX 40 series? Honestly, I really don't think that it's worth waiting. Right now there's no indication that we're even going to get RTX 50 series laptop GPUs next year, which is 2024. Maybe in 2025, but I'm not sure. And the main reason for this is I've actually had a couple of conversations with at least two major brands who have kind of hinted that we're not going to see new laptop GPUs in 2024. Now to be fair, they did tell me that at Computex, which was in like May or July, so obviously there's a lot of time in between then and 2024 and things might change. But honestly it really wouldn't surprise me because when we had RTX 30 series launch we had that for about 12 months. So we had like RTX 3060, 3070 and 3080 launch in January at CES. Then 12 months later at the next CES we got 3070 Ti and 3080 Ti. Then 12 months later after that at the next CES we got 40 series. So based on that past release schedule, assuming the past is anything to go by, then I wouldn't expect new laptop GPUs until CES again in January. And if anything, it'll probably just be a refresh like an RTX 4070 Ti. Which honestly, I would welcome as there is a pretty big performance gap between a 4070 laptop and 4080 laptop. So I think it would be nice to have something to fill that gap. But yeah, just to be clear, no one's told me that there's a 4070 Ti coming. That's just my best guess as to what we might see early next year. So if you actually wanted to wait for 50 series, you wouldn't be buying a laptop laptop until maybe 2025. So yeah, it comes down to whether or not you actually need a laptop now or not. If you do, then just buy now. And this kind of leads in to the next question, which was predictions, thoughts on next year, new gen of laptop GPUs. And I wanted to talk about this one less from the GPU side of things because we just covered that and more about everything else. So we've already seen some CPU leaks from Intel 14th gen desktops and it sounds like it's going to be like 3% faster than 13th gen. And let me put it this way, if the desktop side isn't getting any major improvements, the laptop side isn't going to suddenly surpass it. Because right now the top end Intel 13th gen laptop and desktop CPUs have the same core and thread count and cache. They're basically the same thing just with different power limits. So based on that information, 14th gen in 2024 probably isn't going to offer that much of a boost. And combined with the fact that I've been told that we're not getting RTX 50 series, yeah I'm not really holding my breath for big performance gains next year. And that leads me into this next question. What do you think about the new prices? Honestly, I'm not exactly sure what you meant by this question, but it brings up something that I've really wanted to discuss. For like the first six months of this year, ever since RTX 40 series laptops came out, the prices just weren't that great compared to 30 series options. Don't get me wrong, like the 4080 and 4090 do certainly provide big gains compared to the best 3080 Ti available before it. But then at the mid-range, the 3060 and 3070 Ti aren't too different compared to the 4060 and 4070. But 4060 and 4070 laptops had insane prices, at least until very recently. I don't really know what changed or if it's just a back to school thing, but there have definitely been some excellent deals on gaming laptops out there. We've seen RTX 4070 laptops for a thousand dollars. And just for brief comparison, last year a thousand dollars would get you a good 3060 laptop, and a 4070 is certainly better. So what do I think about the prices? I think they're finally starting to come down and make sense. Maybe they just didn't sell enough in the first half of the year and now they've got heaps of stock that they need to get rid of, I'm not sure. But whatever it is, it's great for you and me buying these laptops. And if you do want to save money on your next gaming laptop, then check out our gamingLaptop.deals website. We update it every day with all of the latest deals 
sales so you can save money on your next laptop. Sales do of course change every day, so yeah, you have to check it out pretty frequently or you might miss something good. Alright, next up we've got a few questions about the new Framework 16 laptop. Do you plan to have a look at the Framework laptops, especially the Framework 16 with a GPU coming up? So the only reason I didn't cover the first Framework laptop is it's not really a gaming laptop, and these days that's pretty much all that we cover here. If it doesn't have discrete graphics, I'm probably not going to have a look at it. But obviously that's changed with the new Framework 16, which is coming out very soon. And I definitely want to get my hands on that one, and the Framework team knows about it. I sent them an email after it was first announced, and I think they're still trying to work out whether or not they're going to have review units and how many they're going to have and which regions they'll ship to, stuff like that. So the details aren't sorted out yet, but I'm hoping that I can borrow one to review. I also met some of the framework team when I traveled to LTX in Canada a month or two ago. And yeah, they knew about the channel and they seemed pretty interested in sending us one to review. So I hope that works out because if I recall, I don't think you can buy one until like 2024 at this point because they were releasing them in like certain amounts at a time and they were just all bought out pretty much as soon as the pre-order opened. So yeah, we'd definitely like to look at the Framework 16 and there were a few more questions about that laptop too. What are your thoughts on the Framework 16? Is it a viable option for future upgrades in regards to price to performance? So I wanted to talk about this one briefly because Dave2D actually did a pretty interesting video about this a few weeks ago. Basically he was saying that although it is really cool that you can upgrade a laptop to this degree that Framework offers, because pretty much no one else does that, and it's obviously great for repairability, at the end of the day you are definitely paying a price premium in order to get those features. Now hopefully that lowers over time as Framework can start producing more of these laptops and more parts, because obviously there are economies of scale once you, you know, start producing say, I don't know, 50,000 laptops instead of a thousand. I have no idea how many they actually make, that's just an example. But yeah, there's definitely a lot of interest in the Framework laptops, so if they can improve the scale then in theory price should come down and I think it would be better. And then at the same time, I mean if you can just pull out the GPU and put a next gen GPU in and you only have to buy the GPU, that could make it pretty good in terms of price to performance because you don't have to buy two laptops, you can just pay for the GPU. So yeah, as for is it a viable option, probably not initially, but yeah, based on those things I just said, uh, it wouldn't surprise me if that changed over time. And in addition to that, what kind of GPU do you think it could theoretically top out at? Uh, now, I don't actually know, because I mean it depends on like the laptop and its cooling and all that, and from what I've seen, you know, it's not exactly a thick laptop, so probably can't go too high in the power department, but you know, laptop GPUs are getting more efficient each generation. So even if we can't go to super high power levels, in theory, once you upgrade the GPU to a new gen, you'd be getting better performance within the same power budget. But the main reason I wanted to talk about this question was, I don't think we're going to see Nvidia GPUs in the framework laptop. Now, I could be completely wrong, but just based on some conversations I've had with different brands, not framework, just to be clear, it sounds like only AMD Radeon graphics are interested in supporting that sort of removable, upgradable GPU kind of situation. Of course anything could change in the future, but yeah, just based on what I've heard, I think we're going to be limited to AMD options. And the fact is, at the moment, they just don't have as many GPU options available compared to Nvidia, especially at the higher end. Alright, next question is something that I get asked pretty regularly. Do you often clean slash repaste your gaming laptops? What thermal putty slash paste do you recommend and does it vary by CPU slash GPU model? So first off, as for repasting, I've only actually done it one time in my own Gigabyte Aero 50 x laptop and that was almost 15 years ago now and honestly it was just for a video because I wanted to see if I could make it cooler. And if I recall my upgrades actually made it worse. So I might not be the one to ask about this, but as for the cleaning part, it's going to depend on your environment. Like if you're in a really dusty area, the laptop fans are going to suck more of that in. Or if you have pets, you know, there's going to be more hair on the surfaces and that's going to get sucked in there too. Or alternatively, if you just live by yourself and you've got an air purifier on, then maybe you won't have to clean anywhere near as much. So I don't think there's any sort of rule, but generally speaking, if you use your laptop every day, I think checking it every six months is probably pretty reasonable. But yeah, as for the thermal paste, personally I wouldn't bother replacing it unless there was some problem that I was trying to fix. I know a lot of people like to try and tune and mod stuff to get the best out of their hardware, but for me personally, as long as it's performing well and it's not melting and super hot to the touch, I'm not even going to bother trying to mess with it. Now I've never actually compared different types of thermal paste because to do that testing it's just an insane amount of work. Like if I wanted to test 10 different pastes 
if I have one laptop, I would want to stress test that laptop for like a month solid or something to make sure I'm getting the best results. And it would just take way too much time. And at the same time, I can't just buy like 10 laptops to put 10 different pastes on. And even then there's silicon lottery differences between CPUs and GPUs between the different laptops. So I suppose I'd be better off using just the one laptop, but I digress. The point is it would take a lot of effort to do properly. But otherwise, in terms of paste, a lot of people seem to recommend the Honeywell PTM7950. Again, I haven't personally used that as I just don't really have the need to repaste myself. But if I was, I would be looking at that one. Which leads us into a related question. How long do you think that liquid metal on a laptop would last after its initial application from the factory? I currently own a 2022 Helios 300 and this is the first time I've ever had a laptop, let alone a system with liquid metal applied to it. So I don't actually have a good answer for this because I haven't used a liquid metal laptop every day long term. But a lot of people have and there aren't really a whole lot of complaints as far as I can tell. I haven't heard anything about the first batch of liquid metal laptops all failing or getting too hot or anything like that. And from looking this up, people say it depends on the application. There are answers for it can last indefinitely as long as it's applied well or two to three years. Ultimately, I would have to imagine that the brand applying the liquid metal has done some sort of testing and would expect it to last the lifespan of the product. Maybe it won't be completely optimal after two to three years, but I wouldn't bother just replacing it because it feels old. I'd only really consider it if something on my laptop was changing, like it was starting to run much hotter than normal and I couldn't explain why. Plus, honestly, changing liquid metal would probably be more of a hassle. Once you pull off the heat pipes, trying to clean up that metal can be a bit of a pain. So yeah, to summarize, if the laptop's fine, personally, I would just leave it and not mess with it. All right, next question. Could you do a comparison between RTX 3070 Ti versus RTX 4060 laptops? And then they go on to say that the 3070 Ti is paired with an older CPU, but the 4060 has a newer CPU. Zen 3 Plus versus Zen 4 in this instance. So I don't know if I would ever do a dedicated video on this topic, but all the data should be available on the channel in a mostly comparable form. For example, I quickly created this graph for you based on data from my 4050 versus 4060 video and 3070 Ti versus 4070 video. We tested the same 25 games on these different laptops, but for different videos at slightly different times. So there might be a bit more variance than what I'm showing here, but I think this is more than good enough to get a rough idea of what to expect. So based on these results, the 3070 Ti is 13% faster at 1440p and 8% faster at 1080p. And just like the example in the question, there is a CPU difference here. The 3070 Ti had an Intel 12th gen CPU, while the 4060 had Intel 13th gen. So yeah, 3070 Ti was a bit better, but that's without considering frame generation. And honestly, the performance gap wasn't that big. So if they were about the same price, I think I might just go for the 4060. But of course, it completely depends on what games you're playing. Personally, I play AAA games at high settings, and those seem to be the titles that make the most sense for frame generation. And in all games I've personally tried it in, I just thought the experience was better. Regardless of what you might think about fake frames or whatever, I just have only had positive experiences using it. But that's me. 3070 Ti is definitely still very capable. All right, next up, it seems like a lot of people want to know about my PC or laptop. So I actually have two links below in the description of every single video linking to what my laptop and desktop PC currently are. So you can check that at any time to find out what I'm using. But basically right now for the laptop, it kind of varies. I currently have a maxed out MacBook Pro 14, but this is on loan from me from Apple for 12 months. I didn't pay for it. And I've just been using it anytime I need a quiet laptop. So like right now when I'm filming this, I don't want the, the fans going crazy with the microphone just sitting out of the shot, or I want nice battery life. Again, right now when I'm sitting here for an hour or two reading these questions. And I also took it with me to Canada recently for LTX, and I used it on the plane for like eight hours and still had more than 50% battery left. And I just wouldn't be getting that with pretty much any gaming laptop. So it's nice to have as an option. Now, while this is definitely capable of video editing, I did actually swap to it for a full week and made some videos. If I need to travel somewhere and I do need to work on videos like Computex or C Yes, I'll take my MSI Z17. It's the 2022 version and yeah, ultimately at the end of the day, I just prefer having a bigger screen when I'm video editing and it's 17 inches, but it's also not quite as big as other 17 inch gaming laptops. It's still relatively thin, so I can fit it in my bag all right. And I like having windows and yeah, the 
as the Nvidia graphics if I wanted to play games or just for video editing. But yeah, the MacBook came after the Z17, so I've only been using that kind of recently. And as I mentioned, it's a 12 month loan, so I'm not gonna get too attached to it. Uh, as for the desktop PC, I recently went and visited Steve at Hardware Unboxed and we did a live stream building my new computer. So I'll leave a link to that video down below. But just quickly, it's got an Intel i9 13900K, NVIDIA RTX 4080, and 64 gigs of RAM. And that's honestly what I use most of the time, because I'm pretty much always at home at my desk working on these videos for this channel. I was actually using the MSI Z17 for almost a year instead of a desktop, because my old Threadripper PC just couldn't handle my video editing workload anymore. So I built a Threadripper Gen 1 PC with 1950X in 2017, and yeah, I used it until 2022, and it really needed an upgrade, and it just yeah, I just had so many problems in the end and it, I just need a new computer. But instead, as an interim solution, I just used the MSI Z17 and I just connected my keyboard and mouse and two monitors to it. So for all intents and purposes, it was kind of like, you know, I'm sitting at my desk and using the computer the same way as I was with the desktop, but I had the MSI Z17 docked to the side. And that laptop actually performed much nicer than the first gen Threadripper. But yeah, I only use laptops if I'm traveling, so it made perfect sense for me to eventually move to a desktop with much more power. And kind of related to that, I've got some questions from my Discord server, which you can join and chat with me in the community by supporting the channel with the link in the description. So the first question from Discord is, most disappointing PC slash laptop slash computer part you purchased ever, other than the Threadripper build if that's the case. So as we just went through, the Threadripper PC is definitely the most disappointing. Just to give you a quick history, I had to run the memory at DDR4 2133 for stability. I ended up having to shut off eight of the 16 cores in by BIOS for stability, and this is kind of unrelated, but the 10 gig network card that was in the Threadripper motherboard that I bought eventually died, so I was limited to gigabit. And I edit my videos off a of NAS, so that kind of sucked. Kind of like my lesson there not to buy Gen 1 hardware, I guess. But yeah, as for the rest of the question, it's really hard for me to answer because since that Threadripper PC that I built in 2017, like I bought that with my own money because the channel was kind of just starting out. But ever since then, I've been in the fortunate position where I haven't actually had to buy a whole lot of hardware. So I guess I get less disappointed with things if I haven't gone and spent my own money on them. The main thing that comes to mind, which isn't really a PC or laptop component, but it's kind Kind of related. Uh, I bought two 10 gigabit switches just for like home networking because I have different rooms like this one where I want fast network connectivity which just speeds up laptop testing if I need to copy files from the NAS. Which happens all the time. Every time we test a new gaming laptop there's hundreds of gigabytes that we copy to it. Like the games for example. So anyway I bought these two 10 gigabit switches for like I think it was 600 Australian dollars each. So maybe like 400 US dollars each. And yeah they were like the cheapest 10 gigabit switches you could buy at the time, so you can probably guess where this is going. The fan noise on them was just ridiculous. So I actually ended up modding both of them and I took the fan out and I put a small Noctua fan in both of them and that greatly improved the fan noise for almost 12 months. And then within like a month or two of each other, both of them just died. Now whether or not that was due to my fan mod, I have no idea. It's possible, but I mean I looked at the specs of the fan that came in both of those switches and the specs of the Noctua, and as far as I could tell the Noctua was just better in every way. And it wasn't just me that had problems with these switches. Steve from Hardware Unboxed actually asked me about networking gear a few months after I bought them, and at that time they were still working perfectly fine. So I told him about these great cheap switches, and I think he bought one or two of them as well. And yeah, if I recall, they all ended up dying for him as well. But yeah, ultimately I would not recommend anyone buys that switch. So once those died, I ended up buying a couple of other switches that were like double the price each from a much more reputable brand and they've been perfectly fine ever since. So yeah, I guess moral of the story is buy once, cry once, which also applies to laptops as well. There's no point buying some super cheap thing if it's not gonna do what you want or even worse, break after a short period of time when you could have spent a bit more getting something good. All right, next question from Discord. If you could redo one laptop review again from scratch, what would it be and why? So I was having a think about this and I couldn't actually think of anything because as soon as I finish a laptop review, I just, I like the feeling of just boxing it up, putting it to the side, sending it away and forgetting about it essentially. That work's done, on to the next thing. But I mean, my first laptop review was like, in 2016 or 2017, so five, six, seven years ago now, something like that. And it was a Clevo unit from Metabox who are a reseller here in Australia. 
I think it would be interesting to cover that one again, just because I test so many things these days that, you know, I didn't know about back then. I mean, pretty much every review I do, I'm learning something new and a way to improve. So I think it would be pretty interesting to compare what I thought counted as my first laptop review to what I could do these days. But unfortunately that laptop uh, wasn't even mine. It was the company's laptop that I worked for at the time and I just took it home and made a video about it and that's how I got started. But yeah, if I still had it, I think it would be pretty interesting to do a revisit. If I recall, it was a quad-core Intel i7-6700HQ and NVIDIA 970M, which was basically the same as a GTX 1050Ti. So it might be okay at some super low-end gaming these days, but yeah, we'll never know. All right, up next from Discord. Tell us more about yourself. How did you get into tech and who slash what inspired you to keep it going all these years? Oh, I guess it depends how far you want to go back. So I think I first got into computers when I went over to my friend's house. I was about 11, I think he was 10, and he had a computer running, I think it was Windows 98. Anyway, long story short, he got me into a game you might know about called RuneScape. And like a lot of people that are interested in tech, I think, you know, we all eventually find gaming. It's just so easy to mix those two interests together because, you know, if you have a good gaming PC, you can play good games. But to do that, you need to know about tech. So I think that was my entry point into like the whole PC world and playing games. So if I was 11 then, that, yeah, that would have been like 2002, maybe 2001. So like 22 years ago now. Uh, if you mean like the YouTube channel and reviews and stuff like that, I remember reading tech reviews in like 2010. So that was when I built my first computer, which I think was an i7-950. And yeah, I just remember looking at the reviews on websites and stuff and thinking, this is pretty cool. Now, I haven't told many people this, but I actually registered a domain for a website that I planned on setting up to make tech reviews, but I never ended up doing anything. I just didn't have any tech to cover, had no idea what I was doing. And yeah, eventually the domain expired and I never used it. And I can't even really remember what it was, but that was like five or six years before I made this YouTube channel. So the interest had been there for a while. And I think I just started watching YouTube reviews like Linus Tech Tips. I think when I started following them, they were like 200, 300,000 subscribers. And for context, I think they're like 15 or 16 million these days. So things have obviously changed. I think Jay's Two Cents was like under 100,000 subscribers. And yeah, that was the kind of content I was watching. And I always thought it was pretty cool. But I also just liked laptops. Back then, there weren't really many laptop options available. So I remember going on like the Apple website in, I don't know, must have been like 2008 or something. Yeah, it would have been 2008, because that's when I bought my first laptop, which was a chunky 17 inch Dell. And yeah, I just remember specking out everything to maximum and just being like, oh man, it would be so cool just to have something like this. Just the fact that it's at least somewhat powerful, I assume, and I can take it anywhere I go. I just thought that was the coolest. But then I kind of forgot about laptops for a few years because I got that 2008 Dell laptop for school. And then I built that PC in 2010 and basically just used desktop PC from then on. In 2012, I bought a MacBook Pro 13, but I ended up putting Windows on it. And I just got it because in 2013, there weren't really any other laptops that had good battery life. And that was just somewhere where Apple dominated. Oh, plus most laptops then had terrible screens and the MacBooks were pretty decent if I recall. And then between buying that MacBook, I just kind of started working full time and I wasn't really that into tech until as mentioned, I started watching those YouTube channels in like 2013, 14, maybe 15. And then in 2015, I think that's when I created this YouTube channel, but I didn't make any content for quite a while. I didn't really know what to do. And as mentioned in that previous question, I had that laptop that I borrowed from work and made my first ever laptop review. I reached out to the company that sold that laptop and they thought the review was decent. And I guess as they're just a small Australian brand and I'm also in Australia, they probably don't get much opportunity to to get their products out there. So they were happy to send me a different laptop. And I mean, I reviewed that laptop and I thought the video was okay, but ultimately most people aren't gonna care about uh, some small Australian company. So what I did is I started doing CPU and GPU comparisons between these laptops. Because yeah, the hardest problem is getting your hands on the hardware. So once you've got the laptops, doing those sorts of comparisons is something that I thought would apply to a much wider audience. And it turns out I was right and the comparisons did pretty well and the channel grew from there. But yeah, honestly, if I didn't do that laptop video, I think I would have gone more into the desktop space because that's what I'm personally more interested in. As I mentioned before, I use a desktop every day when I'm like at my desk working and I only use a laptop when I travel, which isn't too often. But yeah, maybe that was also part of the success us. Who knows, maybe if I ended up doing desktop PC stuff, there would have been too much competition with like Hub Unboxed, Gamers Nexus, and 
everyone else that came around. So that's how we ended up doing gaming laptops and yeah, can't really complain too much. All right, next question from Discord. Have you checked out the Intel present mon tool? If so, any plans to use it in some way during your testing? So in case you didn't hear the news from Gamers Nexus, Intel basically have a present mon tool which measures a new metric called GPU busy. Long story short, it could be very helpful for identifying bottlenecks between CPU and GPU, which I think is gonna be pretty important when it comes to the laptop space. Because unlike a desktop, you can't easily replace the CPU and GPU. So I think it'd be pretty useful to be able to identify to what degree there's a bottleneck between different hardware combinations, or even just different brand laptops. So I think it will have a place, but I haven't used the tool yet. And apart from watching that game as Nexus video, which honestly went so in depth that I don't really know where to begin, I think I'll just have to wait and see how it plays out. All right, what's your thoughts on AMD's FSR3 announcement? So in case you missed it, at Gamescom a few days ago, AMD finally announced FSR3 coming soon, which is basically their version of Nvidia's frame generation, except it works on way more GPUs. Now, I have no idea what the visual quality difference will be between FSR3 and DLSS3. I'll leave that sort of analysis to someone like Tim at Hardware Unboxed. But ultimately, I think it's obviously nice to have a competitor to DLSS3. And as we can use this on more GPUs, I think it might be a great way to get more life out of older laptops. Of course, as long as there's game support, and it might take a while for that to come. We'll have to see, but it does sound promising. All right, next up. Did you get a review unit of Strixgar 17X3D? And related question, do you plan on reviewing the ASUS Gar 17 7945HX3D? Man, that is a mouthful. If yes, when? Can't wait for it, since your reviews are the ones that matter. Well, thanks. So I do actually have that laptop, and long story short, there will be a 25 game comparison coming this Friday, so three days after this video goes live. Uh, they sent it to us a bit late, so I was originally hoping to have the video ready for the embargo, but the laptop ended up arriving on that day. And as you can imagine, it takes a while to test 25 games at three resolutions on three different laptops. So in addition to the 7945HX3D, I'm never gonna get used to saying that. We're also retesting the 7945HX, so the non-3D, which will allow us to see how much of a difference the extra cache actually matters. And we're also retesting Intel's Core i9-13980HX. And those are in the SCAR 17 and 18 respectively. So I have already made a comparison between those two CPUs, but it was like four or five months ago, and there have been plenty of driver updates, Windows updates, and game updates since then. So yeah, it's taken like a week, but it's almost done, and we've retested all three laptops in all 25 games. Basically, as soon as this video is done, I'm gonna go and continue working on that one. So you'll see it soon. You do great graphs comparing current year laptops. Thanks. Do you have any comparable graphs across years? I'd love to see where top 2020, 2021, 2022 laptops line up against today's incomparable tests. How many years a top laptop keeps up with the pack? Yeah, it would be really nice to do that, but it is very difficult for a number of reasons. The first reason is most laptops we get are borrowed review units, so they get sent back after we're done with them, which means no opportunity for future retesting. The next reason is if you were to compare data from 2020, which is three years ago now, there are so many other things that have changed since then, like Windows updates, driver updates, stuff like that. So you would definitely need the laptop to test fresh, but as mentioned, that's very hard. Now, I do actually own a whole bunch of laptops that I purchased with my own money. And occasionally when we add a new test, I will go back through those and do uh, some data collection just to have some results from older laptops. But I think the real reason I don't include a lot of that in the graphs in the laptop reviews is just that a lot of that older stuff really isn't competitive anymore. Like if I'm reviewing an RTX 4060 laptop, I guess it would be nice to have a 1060 result in there. So if you do have a 1060, you could see, oh, this is how much of a performance boost I could expect. But something I have trouble with is I can only fit like 20 results in each graph and I tend to prioritize stuff from the same generation. So like if I have 10, 40, 60 results, I'll probably put all the other 40, 60s in so we can see how they compare. I'll maybe put two or three 40, 70s just above so you can decide if it's worth spending more and same deal for the 40, 80 and 40, 90 and then maybe like a 140, 50 result underneath. And then by that point, the graph's already pretty much full. So I try to put in some last gen results 
Uh, usually I do maybe a 3060, a 3070 Ti, and a 3080 Ti. But yeah, that's basically it. There just wouldn't really be too much space to put a 1060 in, or just something else old, for example. I don't know, it's difficult. Like, I still do personally own 1060, 1660 Ti, 2060, and 2070 laptops. And I pull those out occasionally if I'm doing, like, a, a revisit video or a dedicated comparison. But yeah, it's just not something that's probably going to appear too frequently, especially in laptop reviews, for those reasons. There are some tests I have that do have comparable data that can go back a bit further. Like on my jareds.tech website, I have the results from like 130 laptops in Cinebench, both with the charger plugged in and without. And because Cinebench R23 hasn't changed over the years, that's comparable data. That, that's only one aspect, which is CPU performance. I don't really have anything that counters for GPU like gaming. I mean, technically in my Excel spreadsheet, I do have like all my three comparison games, so like Control, Red Dead Redemption, Cyberpunk, going back like two or three years. But I also choose not to feature those older results just because they're older results. It just wouldn't be a fair comparison due to differences like drivers and game updates. I mean, if we want to be realistic, even the graphs that I have in my review videos aren't always the most comparable. Like I mentioned, I include 3060, 3070 Ti, and 3080 Ti results so we can get an idea of where last gen fits in. But I mean, realistically, most of those laptops I have probably haven't had in about 12 months. It probably doesn't matter to quite as much a degree in some of the games, like Control, because I don't think that's been updated in forever, and any driver updates coming out aren't gonna suddenly target that game to improve it. But yeah, like Red Dead Redemption still gets updates. Do those results still fairly represent a 3060? Maybe, maybe not. But yeah, unfortunately, I just can't own every single laptop, so that's just a real-world limitation of the testing. Which again is why I like to preference current-gen laptops, because at least I know all of the testing has been done relatively recently. What are your thoughts on a current lack of higher-tier Radeon mobile GPUs? Yeah, I was really expecting something like a 7800M, but we just haven't got it yet. Uh, AMD only just announced the 7800 XT for the desktop, and desktop GPUs usually come out before mobile, so maybe there'll be a 7800M coming to laptop. But if it is, I haven't heard anything about it, and I probably wouldn't expect that news until CES in January, if I had to guess. It kind of sucks, because I guess it gives NVIDIA, you know, room to do whatever they want. And as mentioned earlier, for the first six months of this year, RTX 40 laptops cost a lot of money. But also, as mentioned earlier, they have come down significantly. What's your opinion on features like FSR2 slash upcoming FSR3, DLSS, frame generation, and ray tracing? So I think the upscaling technologies like FSR and DLSS, uh, they're really great. Hardware Unbox did a video comparing FSR against DLSS in terms of quality, and I think it was like 20 plus games, which is just ridiculous. And I think they ended up concluding that DLSS was in most cases superior. But FSR, you know, still better than not having it. Good way to improve FPS if you don't have NVIDIA graphics or RTX graphics. So definitely appreciate what it offers. As for FSR 3, I think it'll be good to have something kind of similar to frame generation that doesn't require RTX 40 graphics. But as for frame generation, I think I said earlier in this video, every time I've used it in games that support it, it's always been a positive experience. Better having it on than not having it. But again, I don't play any competitive games. I play mostly AAA games with high settings, high resolution, and it just makes it feel smoother. And as for ray tracing, I still don't really think it's critical, but that said, if games I play do have it, I do tend to turn it on, because as mentioned earlier, I've got a RTX 4080 in my desktop, so there's not really any problems turning ray tracing on, but when it comes to laptops, ray tracing is still a pretty big struggle unless you've got top-end hardware. So yeah, I think ray tracing is a nice-to-have feature. I would even say frame gen and FSR 3 are nice-to-have features, but I'd lean those towards being more useful and more important than ray tracing. And then just standard DLSS and FSR, they're pretty widespread these days. Um, I wouldn't say they're critical, but definitely very useful. And there's either FSR or DLSS in most modern games for that reason. Have you ever considered reviewing other kinds of tech in addition to gaming laptops? An occasional GPU and non-gaming laptop. So when I started the channel out, if you sort through the videos by oldest to newest, you'll see that it was kind of just throwing out anything and seeing what worked. The biggest reason for this was just that I didn't have a whole lot of tech to review at the time, so I worked with what I had. But if there's anything I've learned from doing YouTube videos for the last six, seven, eight years now, is that YouTube really likes you to find a niche and just stick to that. Well, I mean, it's not really YouTube. So people always talk about the YouTube algorithm, but I always think that you can replace that uh, with 
people. YouTube algorithm just exists to follow people and give them what they want. Now, if you're subscribing to a channel, chances are it's because there's something there that you're interested in. I just don't think most people are interested in every sort of tech device, so I chose to focus to laptops. And even since focusing to laptops, I had to niche down even further into gaming specific models. So we pretty much only review gaming laptops these days. But even with that, our workload is pretty much non-stop. There's just an unlimited number of gaming laptops and different comparisons we can make. So there's no shortage of work. And I think it's better to be known as one of the places to go for one specific type of content rather than just trying to cover everything. Linus Tech Tips style, I guess. I think those more general style cha channels just don't really work out these days anymore. What do you think about the performance leap in laptops we had this year? Example, 4060 laptops versus 3060 and 2060. Yeah, I kind of discussed earlier that the mid-range, like 4070 and 4070, isn't really a whole lot better compared to 30 series. We only really saw big gains with RTX 4080 and 4090 mobile GPUs, which do offer significant performance increases compared to the best from last gen. But they also cost way more money too. Now, 4060 was only, what, like 15 or 20% faster than 3060 or something? I can't remember what the difference between 2060 and 3060 was, but yeah, it's not a big difference. Nvidia is definitely relying on features like frame generation, which makes me wonder if RTX 50 series is gonna be the performance boost everyone's after. It's so like when RTX 20 series first came around, I think it was more of like a feature launch, like here's ray tracing, here's Gen 1 DLSS, which initially, as everyone might remember, wasn't very good, but now DLSS is quite excellent. So it took some time to develop. And then we had the 30 series, which I don't think really had any big feature improvements. It seemed to be more improving performance. And then with 40 series, it's kind of like 20 series again, where we've got features. So DLSS 3 and frame generation, but then not much performance increase. So maybe with 50 series, um, we'll stick to the features we've got and get more performance. But yeah, that's just my best guess based on what we've seen in the past. I've got a question from a channel supporter. So you can get that logo by your name by clicking the join join button below the video and supporting the channel. Is mini LED on laptops worth it? And at what price does it start making sense? <sighs> yeah, I remember at the start of the year, everyone was basically saying stuff like, no mini LED screen, no buy. And honestly, I didn't really get it. Look, mini LED can be good, but in most of the laptops I've tested, I think it's kind of overhyped. I think it really depends on how many uh, dimming zones you've actually got, because a lot of laptops just don't have enough dimming zones. And when you move the mouse cursor around on the screen, you can just see all the zones lighting up and I just don't think it looks very good. There are some implementations, um, I can't actually remember which laptops off the top of my head, where it does actually look pretty good and there are plenty of dimming zones and that's not really a problem. And generally mini LED screens are lighter and I think all the ones I've tested have good color gamut. So usually pretty good quality screens, just not something I'm super interested in due to the way the dimming zones work. Personally, I much prefer OLED. So as for what price it starts making sense, yeah, I don't know. I guess it depends how much you value the extras that you're getting with mini LED. Maybe it makes sense to pay an extra $100, $200 if you're spending $2,000 and it's something you really want. Well, I think that's going to do it for now. Most people don't make it this far into the video. So if you're still here, then comment musical pizza shoes so that I know you made it. Don't worry if I missed your question. I'm going to get back into doing these videos monthly, so make sure you're subscribed. Or as mentioned, you can use the link below to join our Discord community. But until the next Q&A, there were actually a lot of questions that I've already answered in the last one. So check that one out next. It is pretty long, so just look at the timestamps and see if there's any interesting questions you care about. I'll see you in that one next.